continue on uh, with this uh, lecture on flash and monetization. If you are here earlier, you know that I've been giving away a small trivia prize by in, uh, the introduction to every speech. Since we're talking about flash, you guys can't answer. Flash started life a long time ago as a standalone application from FutureWave. Can anybody tell me the name of the application that Flash came from? It's a very difficult question. If people can't answer it, then I, I have a, another question. Okay, the answer was Smart Sketch. And you knew that. So the, the question for the prize is, can anybody tell me what year Smart Sketch was released? It's an interactive. If you don't know, ask, and I'll say higher or lower. Higher than 87, or recent. Lower than 97. Not quite? He's going to get there eventually. It's going to be 93. <laughs> An interesting piece of trivia. One of the first customers of Smart Sketch was one of the architects who worked on Bill Gates' house. My job is very easy. I'm going to introduce Alex, and Alex will introduce the panel. Alex works for Spill. If you don't know who Spill are, you're at the wrong conference. Alex, take it away. Uh, yeah, thanks for the fantastic introduction, Nick. So we got a uh, panel here about monetizing Flash games across different platforms. And uh, I just want to make it clear that we're talking about Flash as a technology for making games. And whatever you can make with it, you can obviously monetize. And we're going to talk about various ways of monetizing it. So it's going to be about social, about web games, about you know Facebook, obviously. So we got a fantastic lineup of people here today. Uh, we got uh, Marilyn Gore, uh, the lead engineer from FlashGameLicense.com, which is essentially eBay for Flash games. Uh, we got Gregor Sargassian, uh, the CEO of Plexonic. And we got a... Uh, surprise entry, just like uh, from yesterday, uh, by Alex Mandelov, the head of studio of Game House. So I'm going to kick it off with a, uh, you know, Flash Gaming and I. How uh, did you guys get into Flash games? Uh, what do you do and how is your business connected with Flash games? I mean, kick it off, cool. Marilyn. <coughs> well, um, I was actually a developer to start. Um, I just made escape games actually and uh, I put them on flashgamelicense.com um, and sold it for much more than I thought I would <laughs> and um, I loved the service Flash Game Licence gave me so I asked if I could um, help them g give something back and here I am, work for them now. Yeah, uh, we actually uh, st was started the devil of Flash games from the first day in, in Plexonic and uh, at the time the f Flash was a very hot technology. And it's, uh, we think it's still a hot technology. And uh, it was just the way to make some great online games. So Gamehouse is involved in Flash games on, on different levels. We are one of the largest publisher, publishers of casual downloadable titles, which are generally Flash downloadable games. We also uh, publish um, uh, Flash games online. And we are a a developer of social games as well, which uses Flash the technology. So by definition that you had had put forth earlier, we kind of do all three in Flash. All right, so uh, just to give some perspective, so we got like two developer guys here, a developer who turned into a uh, Flash game licensing guy, and uh, uh, I guess I could position myself as what we will refer to in this discussion as a sponsor. A sponsor of Flash game is someone who just puts uh, who pays a Flash game developer to put a splash screen ad into the game itself, uh, which is essentially you know, uh, uh, referred to in the conference as a publisher in uh, Casual Connect here today. So uh, let's talk about the most common way of uh, monetizing a Flash game, which is to license it, hence flashgamelicense.com. So, uh, Marilyn, can you tell us a little bit about how developers can make money of smaller, simpler games by putting it on FlashGameLicense.com or something else? Well, when um, licensing first started with Flash games, um, the only license that was around was an exclusive license, and that's when you pretty much emailed hundreds of sponsors hoping someone would buy your game. You say, please buy it for me, and then they'd tell you a price and you'd have to accept it and then they basically owned your game. Um, I mean, it's progressed since then, exclusive license is still around, 
and um, what you do is you as a sponsor gives you a lump sum um, and you he basically owns the IP of your game you give it to him and um, they put it on their site and generally it won't be on any other site um, they all keep the exclusive on their site um, so all the players will have to go to their site to play the game um, since flash game license came about we actually coined the term primary license because we felt that um, it was too um, much on the sponsor side and not on the developer side. So um, we decided to introduce a primary license, which means that you don't sell your IP. Um, you give them the game and you put their branding in it and they distribute it virally. It goes on plenty of sites. Um, but you retain the IP of that um, license which uh, of the game, which means that you can sell a secondary license, which is, which is what we call a non-exclusive. And um, these licenses will generally be locked to the sponsor to a website. So, for example, Addicting Games says, I want a non exclusive of, of your site. You'll lock it to make sure that the game can't be distributed. Um, it'll only work on the Addicting Games, but um, it'll have their branding. And that um, works with a primary license. Um, what came about recently as well is performance deals. Um, and sponsors sometimes prefer this because it gives them more um, security. A performance deal would be where um, a game will, uh, a developer will get paid based on how well the game does. So that's the number of clicks, number of views. And um, I mean, sometimes sponsors will give you a deal where they'll give you a lump sum and then give you a uh, performance deal on top of it. In terms of the actual amounts, um, the exclusive, while the least popular, generally brings the most money because you're giving it the whole IP of your game. I mean, we see. Um, Exclusives go range from a few thousand to tens of thousands, sometimes forty, fifty thousand per game. Um, primary licenses um, they actually bring quite a lot of money as well. I mean, there's a huge range. Obviously, I mean, some sell for a few hundred, but we've seen games sell for eighty thousand, sixty thousand, forty thousand. Um, Non-exclusives um, much less, obviously, because it's just locked to the um, website. Um, and mostly they will sell for a few hundred, maybe five hundred dollars. But we have seen non-exclusives go for seven thousand. Steambirds, I don't know if you've heard of the game, but um, that had a seven thousand dollar non-exclusive. Um, yeah. So uh, if we are talking about uh, performance licensing, is that similar to like revenue sharing deals, like uh, which is you know used more commonly around the casual games business? Um, yeah, it's. I, w I think it's a bit different. Um, perform performance deals are more. Um, it's so it's not you're really basically a share the risks and the success. Well, you're of sharing the, the risk, but you're not sharing the revenue really. I mean, they're paying you based on how well it does. Well, they do make money off of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we can ask uh, Grevork about uh, how he makes money off flash games. Um, well, actually. Uh, we don't make money from flash games because uh, we <laughs> we, dev we develop social games and uh, we monetize you know, social platforms, and uh, that's pretty pretty different monetization scheme when licensed. Well, it's still made in flash. Yes, yes, made, yeah. we still made the flash, and uh, it's uh, we develop social games, and uh, as you know, the flash is uh, dominant technology for building uh, social games on Facebook. I guess I mean HTML5. There are there are some HTML5 games, but uh, only a few of them, and there are some reasons for that, of course, uh, because uh, HTML5 has some advantages and disadvantages, and Flash is very uh, developed technology. And uh, uh, for example, we always were targeting to uh, are targeting on making uh, high-end games, and our games are top top quality and very uh, high uh, with high quali quality graphics and. Uh, game mechanics and actually uh, Flash allows us to to, uh, to keep this quality and uh, we'll do almost anything nowadays. When, uh, so HTML5 is quite early and uh, in, in early stage and I think everyone has troubles on uh, creating uh, some complex products with it. Uh, when monetizing on social on uh, uh, Facebook uh, is is, is a different different question because I mean uh, so there is no licensing involved really it's just end user monetization yes, of obviously yes. social games I mean I mean I think I think there are very few cases uh, there, there are some cases when uh, companies license 
the social games to other uh, publishers uh, but I, I think mostly on uh, social platforms uh, it's it's most like revenue share deals or um, some some kind of partnerships it could but be a, could there be are still sometimes you know licensing involved in the yes. social games aspect right yes um, but uh, still uh, social games are different from uh, uh, small port portal games that are um, I, think, right. I think the games that are sold on uh, flash gaming license are smaller in the content yes and uh, social games are different uh, because uh, I mean th they are they are really run as, as services and uh, uh, actually you can't uh, make a game and when uh, license it uh, license it uh, to other company and when uh, forget about it uh, it's it's a day-to-day -day operations uh, coming coming with the game and the team actually have to stay with the game and improve it uh, on a weekly yeah. basis while the on the flash game license you just make a game you sell it once you made your money and you make the next game yeah, you sell a few times. yes or sell it a few yes. times with non-exclusive AK Silox. Alex uh, have you guys ever encountered any licensing of flash games in any way at all um, yeah, we have done a bunch of licenses, but I think it's in a different uh, in a different sense. We've licensed brands and developed so games through those. So okay. there's definitely licensing involved. Um, so you actually buy the licenses to develop right. games. It's, it's the opposite of making money on licensing. <laughs> it's paying money <laughs> for licensing. So, yeah, so we, we did do that for sure. Um, on so did you make any money in the end? Yes. Uh, well, Family Feud is one of the uh, one of the games that we were involved in before the acquisition of uh, before Backstage Technologies was acquired by um, Game House last year. So that was definitely uh, an example of successful license. Um, and we are about to release a new game based on license as well. So we'll see the success of that one too. Um, did you want me to talk about portal monetization? No. Well, if you're going to get into portal monetization, sure. Uh, well, we're a portal. And uh, we do uh, iframed uh, flash games as well as casual download games as well. A lot of times those two are connected and that's kind of the best way to monetize it. But um, if you're talking about just monetizing flash games on a, on a portal or as you refer to it, portal games, uh, we're talking about advertising is, is kind of the, the de facto standard of how you monetize those games. Um, and it's probably, it's, it's for a developer or for a publisher, it's the lowest lift, but it's probably not not the best amount of revenue you can get if you can also package your game as a as a downloadable game and then use the two in conjunction to promote one another. Uh, you're going to do much better. So that's uh, that's probably the best way to monitor. Okay. Well, let's uh, move on into the buyers. So, you know, we buy a lot of uh, flash games, and as I said, I am the only uh, let's say sponsor here. So. Um, what we typically look in a game uh, as a sponsor is how many gameplays do we estimate it, it's going to make. And the beauty, well, for us as a sponsor of uh, licensing smaller Flash games is that we actually see them ready before making an offer. So we play a nearly finished game on FlashGameLicense.com uh, versus, you know, if it's a work for hire in typical game development, you actually invest and then you have to wait, you have milestones, it's a totally different game. Uh, so, uh, can you, uh, Merlin, can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, how the buyer and uh, developer interaction works on Flash Game License? Um, well, as you say, they put their game on Flash Game License and um, people can, I mean, it's, it's hidden from the public, but sponsors can come along and um, play the game. And... Um, the, w the way they interact is either they'll, um, I mean, publicly post on the feedback of that game and say, oh, look, I mean, I, I'm interested in this game, but it needs this and that. Or, you know, they'll send each other private messages or they'll start emailing. Um, generally, um, sponsors will not be extremely public with the way that they um, communicate with developers. O obviously, it's a business and they're trying to um, get the um, developer's interest. They don't want to pique other sponsors' interest by showing their interest. Um, but um, I mean, there's there's a whole range of ways that they can interact with the um, developer. What, what else do you want me to touch on? Um, so basically, uh, I I just want to add that the core business difference between a social flash game and just a flash game is that 
uh, the money is made here not from end users. As we already said, the main uh, way of monetizing these flash games is advertising. So, uh, as a social game developer, Alex, uh, uh, do you see uh, potential in uh, hybrid business models? So you said that, okay, you, you do have iframe games on your website. Uh, how does that work in conjunction with social games where users actually pay for stuff in the game? So it's like a B2C and a B2B marketplace, right? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so what you're asking, I suppose, or just let, let me repeat the question. The question is, um, if you had a Flash Portal game, um, would you be able to monetize it in any other way besides yes. advertising? That, that's what I'm asking. And I think I think the answer is definitely yes. And I think what you'll what you'll see is definitely a hybrid um, set of business models. Um, I think they'll probably gravitate toward what's happening with Facebook today, in terms of the um, kind of virtual economies and monetizing through virtual currency. So I, I do see that um, that you could, you can certainly do that. We're definitely a portal that is socializing today. I think you will see features in Flash games or that, that could, where Flash games can write to APIs that let you socialize your game and then monetize it through microtransactions. Well, continuing that topic uh, about, you know, uh, there is a general understanding that on Facebook you publish uh, social games. Well, that's not fully true because what we do with uh, games that we buy on Flash Game License, for example, is we publish them on our own portals, but we also have uh, applications on Facebook and Hives.nl, which is a Dutch social network. And what we do is we connect them to the social graphs of those social networks and have them in our app on those social networks. So essentially it's like flash gaming portal in the traditional sense of the word, but played on a social network. So I just see a lot of uh, dynamic tendencies going on here that uh, I see a lot of developers who started out making really small flash games now moving into more complicated, more serious projects like uh, people over here develop. So uh, moving on. Uh, I added a slide about uh, Molehill uh, 3D flash game, so also known as Stage 3D. Um, it feels that this is a big deal and I see it being discussed all around. So what do you guys think about Molehill and uh, hardware acceleration for flash games? I don't know, let's start with Alex, maybe. Have you guys looked at it at all? You want me to answer a technical question? <laughs> No, I mean uh, the potential of having hardware acceleration in a flash-powered game, right. be it a social game, for example. Right. How would you guys, you know, uh, benefit from that? Because well, you I have, you know, direct hardware acceleration. You can have fantastic 3D graphics going on. I, I, well, the obvious answer is is that um, that obviously expands our scope of the types of games that we can develop and publish, um, and um, and then so we can push the quality of our games as far as you know, 2D versus 3D. Um, the question then becomes, is, is that going to be a more compelling experience for the user? So I think I would get excited about it if, if it was, if the answer was yes. Um, but what we've seen thus far is that social games, per se, are not, are not really CPU intensive in the first place. And the best ones are not the ones that have the most graphics and the most, uh, uh, and the most use of you know, high-end technology. So you know, I think hardware acceleration will be fun to have and there's going to be some cool games made on it. I don't think that's going to be the kind of the center of attention of social game developers. Um, uh, I, can, I can take deeper uh, insight into technical part. Uh, I, think, I think the molehill uh, opens opportunity uh, for creation a whole new dimension of uh, games, not only on Facebook but on the web itself because it uh, actually first time offers uh, a uh, very uh, usable 3D uh, API uh, for web technology. And um, I, th I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of companies were struggling to bring uh, 3D games, uh, kind of uh, solving some, some, some uh, traditional uh, game mechanic issues uh, with, with a new dimension 
in 3D envi environment. And I think, I think this is going to be a very important uh, change because uh, now the, all those companies and uh, studios or developers will have opportunity to pursue their ideas. And uh, I think this, this, is a great, this is great because uh, we see some uh, tendency of uh, uh, having the same uh, game genres over and over on, uh, on Facebook. I mean, you, you rarely see something new uh, developed, uh, not on only Facebook, nor in, in many other, all, on all portals. And uh, Molehill opens opportunity for bringing uh, totally new genres like racing games that are actually really playable. And uh, whole, whole uh, you know, but it's the could, could development costs also rise significantly when you're going into 3D. So, you know, we're talking about monetizing games, yeah. and obviously if you d develop a higher-end game, its development costs are going to be significantly bigger, while uh, the audience that we are marketing games to is still more or less the same. How would you deal with that? Yeah, Because the investment true. is a lot bigger. Yeah, it, uh, so definitely 3D games, uh, uh, they depend more efforts uh, uh, just because of uh, complexity of the problems solved there. But uh, at the same time, I think the payback is quite adequate. Uh, adequate, And uh, um, uh, I think I think the, uh, it's also will be uh, a question of, of the quality uh, of the uh, developer's team. I mean, I mean, let's say we, we, we're not going to have any problems uh, uh, doing a 3D games, you know, because uh, actually I, I, I think in uh, uh, saying that the Facebook online games are CPU, not CPU intensive. I wouldn't agree uh, because actually uh, if you build a really complex game, uh, you are uh, always balancing on the edge of, uh, of possibilities uh, of, the, of the machine, of the workstation. And uh, it's actually a big problem. The biggest problem is to uh, achieve a, a sustainable performance on, on a weak or, or, or average uh, uh, PC machine or or on, or on Mac, and actually, um, uh, I just want to say that we. All, I mean, I think most of developers, uh, social game developers, had this problem. It's not something new, and uh, uh, this complexity of problems already was for, for them there. Uh, the 3D will just uh, add maybe a little bit, slightly uh, some more uh, issues to solve for them. But I think once. The technology is there. In a couple of months, I think most of the studios will adopt solutions, which will be, uh, I think, uh, which will allow them to de develop games in quite rapid pace. And uh, I, I, I'm very optimistic about the molehill. I think it's going to be really, really great. All right. Uh, what about you, Merlin? Uh, you got a whole bunch of independent game developers on your website. Uh, what's the general attitude towards molehill and the Again, rising development costs versus the monetization. Well, what we see is, I mean, of course we're excited about 3D, but I mean, um, essentially in Flash gaming, I mean, the um, building Flash games, the beauty of it is that costs are extremely low. And um, I mean, I, while we'd love to see 3D everywhere, um, I mean, I doubt that it will be adopted for a while just because the costs are so high. And um, you, don't, you don't reap those benefits back, personally. I, I don't think... Um, the costs are low enough for developers to adopt it. I mean, what we expect to see is a few standout early games from um, from developers. But we, I, I think the um, it's it will be all about keeping the costs down. And right now they're they're too high. I mean, the import the importance of um, graphics has always risen, and over the years it continues to rise. But um, it's it's still all about the cost, and we don't think that the costs are low enough. Um. Uh, just one remark. Um, maybe there, there, there is a, a group of developers uh, producing uh, uh, flash games with, with uh, limited content. Uh, and I agree. I mean, the portal flash games, they are quite small in user user experiences, quite short there. And yeah, they are they are cheap. But say for uh, for us and many other studios, actually. Uh, uh, Producing flash games is no different from producing uh, game games on other or any, on any other platform. It's it's just technology. Uh, say for our development team, it's not team of flash developers. Uh, our team is a is a team of great game developers. They can 
you can very easily uh, move to other platform and do the same uh, stuff, you know, the same quality there. So what you're saying is that developers from other platforms will actually adopt Flash. Uh, I think I think Flash is great because it's it's so mature technology. But uh, I mean, uh, in the beginning, Flash was you know uh, was this, uh, was created as as a, as a tool uh, satisfying needs of very wide uh, range of uh, clients or customers, from starting from designers, you know, ending up I mean for some hardcore developers. And uh, I, th I think the tendency is that actually it becoming more and more. Uh, uh, a tool or framework for developing really high-end games. And I'm glad that HTML5 is there because it took over all these uh, uh, all of, all of, uh, t projects or tasks like, you know, making a banner. Now, I mean, it's easy to make it in HTML5 and uh, in Flash. And it's, it's great because I think, I think Adobe will focus now more on uh, polishing Flash and making it really hardcore uh, or high-end game game uh, development or, or application uh, development speaking environment. Speaking of uh, higher-end games, uh, Merlin mentioned that you know the uh, attitude amongst independent developers of smaller flash games is that you know not really worth it. Well, what we're seeing right now uh, at Spill Games is that uh, we uh, what we did is we published a couple of uh, really high-end Shockwave 3D games. Obviously, that requires a plugin, so some users aren't too happy about that. Most users have Flash, but not everyone has Shockwave. And the amount of engagement in those games is just staggering. So, which means that the portion of people that play the game, as uh, that, you know, a lot of people weren't happy about it, but the portions that did play it was so big and so happy with an engaging experience that, you know, they want more. Um, how different was the license for, for the developer? Did you pay a lot more for it? Uh, it was way more than a standard flash game, yes. Right. So I'm just saying that uh, what we're what we're seeing right now is that higher quality games they just tend to stand out more right now because we have an influx of new developers coming to the market, trying out new stuff, and obviously there is a lot of uninspired games on the market that are really cheap. So the market is saturating, and I think that uh, with Molehill out, uh, this is going to help people stand out more. Obviously, the risks are higher with higher development costs. Um, I mean, we, we get a lot of indie developers on our site, and a lot of them um, rely on licenses to pay rent. And um, the thing is, I mean, there'll be a high initial cost. And I mean, unless a sponsor, for example, um, invests in a developer and gives them a bit of um, money before he makes the game, I, I so you're talking more about partnership. Well, partnership, yeah, or um, an investment. Mm -hmm. You know, just just so, but because the developer won't be able to invest the money into initially getting the technology and um, to create so the 3D games. How do you guys uh, help facilitate that on Flash Game License? Um, we've actually um, invested in developers before um, that we wanted to help out. But, um, I mean, for now, we don't, we don't have a service that we invest, but we do um, connect developers with sponsors. We, we've actually started a game agent service where... Um, We've assigned our staff to, to sponsors on our site, and, and um, these staff get to know the sponsor, know what they like, and then find games for them. Um, and then we can push developers towards them as well and go, well, this guy wants to create an awesome 3D game, and you guys have started um, making 3D games. Would you like to invest? That kind of thing. Okay, well, that's a pretty clear stance. You know, so it's still unclear whether or not uh, Stage 3D, aka Molehill, is going to take off or not. So uh, let's uh, talk about partners. So uh, Grevork, uh, from uh, what I understand, you built a business uh, by building uh, games for a partner uh, game duel. How does that work out for you, and why did you decide to go with that business model? Uh, well, actually, uh, it's... Uh it's a strategical choice, and uh, I mean each uh, each team should make its own choice in this uh, uh, for this question. I mean, uh, it's 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 a matter of what you want to achieve, and uh, uh, what are your weaknesses, and what what your uh, partner is cap capable uh, to bring to the table. And uh, for us, it's wor worked pretty well, and we are very happy with our partnership with GameDoll, and uh, we are we are we are very strong in. Game production and Game Duel has its uh, marketing and uh, uh, platform possibilities, and uh, 
when uh, I think we are making a really, really good fit uh, for each other. And uh, uh, again, it's it's not mandatory. Uh, it's just I think I think it's it's a very uh, uh, interesting uh, model for for small studios that are uh, let's say struggling uh, in mar marketing or uh, uh, some some other aspects. Uh, I think alliances can can make some really good benefits for for bo both sides. But again, this is it should be done very carefully, of course, because it's like you know marrying a woman. You, know? you, <laughs> you, you have to know whom are you marrying, and uh, and it's uh, uh, it should be thought through. And of course, uh, I think it's very important that you that you find a partner who has a complementary uh, set of skills. Uh, so I say I think I think I think uh, working. Uh, Working with a with a, say two two development studios working together is kind of uh, have have a very low chance of um, making a success because I mean there, there there was some other development studios coming to us and saying you know let's do something together and the question was you know okay guys you know, w what we should do together and uh, we are developers we are also developers and um, it's going I mean it's very tough to find some model that we can sustain our uh, our uh, efforts or our, our New projects that we're gonna pursue together. But if there's a partner who can do more with something that you can't, that's when when it can be interesting. Uh, and uh, my advice will be, I mean, for for smaller teams, this can be a very nice way to grow the company, to get some more experience. And um, of course, I think I think the very important is for those companies who who will try to go to such relationship is also think about uh, how they're going to exit the relationship at some point because if if they don't think about that I mean they can have some problems at some time and, uh, and it's not a thought through or agreed uh, uh, there is no mechanism agreed uh, how, how the relationship would uh, be uh, cancelled uh, or terminate, terminated when it will create some you know you know not nice relationship I mean or you don't want that you know you want to have good relationship with all your partners I think the industry is very small and uh, of course uh, you don't want your reputation to be broken that way and uh, or or it could be even some legal consequences for you if you, if you so you know, always right. have an exit plan out of marriage exactly, right exactly <laughs> yeah it's like you know having of a marriage contract like this yeah, yeah. A prenuptial yeah, pre ah, yes. yes have a prenup prenuptial. Okay, that's good advice in general. <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, talk about uh, platforms. You know, so where is the money coming from? Where is the sponsors coming from? So we have uh, Flash Game License to tell us a little bit about that. So Marilyn, you know, we have like uh, gaming portals like the Spill Network. Uh, what other sponsors are there? Who else is spending money on licensing Flash games or just paying Flash game developers in general? Well, um, the majority of people on Flash Game License, the majority of sponsors on Flash Game License are, are, are portals, big game portals, and that's what they're here for, new, fresh content. Um, and th that's not surprising. We don't actually have a lot, um, many Facebook or um, social network sponsors on our site, but we do have big companies coming to us and um, asking for um, games for advertising basically we've had Warner Brothers links come to us and, and say you know make this game we want to advertise this new deodorant um, and we find them a developer and make a game for them and those are usually quite um, large projects um, what I mean we also see um, portals do different kind of things like a few years ago King.com used to um, license games from us but not to put them on their own sites they had their own development their own games um, a sort of casino like um, website going on and what they did was they licensed games on Flash Game License purely to spread them virally and push users onto their site. It wasn't for the game itself but um, it was to push all these um, players to their site that which, which had different games on them. Um, but the majority of sponsors are portals on FGL. Okay, so basically um, it's uh, what's happening right now is that bigger companies are coming in wanting to buy content you know, either for themselves, not for the gaming websites, or uh, I also hear that some bigger players want to buy content in bulk, for example, yeah. like have bulk deals, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, like um, we, we, can have, we have companies come to us sometimes and go, okay, we want 100 games and we'll 
go and find them for them. Basically, we've started a service called Easy License where um, we're cutting all the red tape um, for sponsors. So what we do is instead of a sponsor having to uh, make 100 contracts for 100 different developers in 100 different company, uh, countries, um, they come to us and go, OK, we want 100 games, 50 social games, and we'll go and find them and for them. And we will write the contract um, with the developer to Flash Game License, and there'll be one contract for the sponsor with us. And um, they, the sponsor actually finds that extremely useful. If they want a whole bunch of fresh content or if they're starting a new um, portal service, um, they'll come to us and go, okay, we want a bunch of content and we'll give it to them. Okay, then. Um, shall we talk about, uh, well, essentially game design. So when you uh, design a game, uh, obviously, uh, within Flash Game License, you design the game so that it gets sponsored, and uh, that's about it. But uh, are there any um, game design mechanics that uh, should be used to monetize games in different platforms? So I heard yesterday uh, Arcadium was talking about how they made a game and uh, put it out on a lot of different platforms, uh, the uh, Magjong Dimensions game. Uh, so. Can you guys uh, share some insights on uh, what types of games can be monetized in different ways, not only as a social game, but perhaps as a flash game or even a mobile game? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I think uh, uh, nowadays uh, freemium games becoming uh, like a, a dominant or most successful strategy uh, for for making a ga successful game. and. Uh, so if you have a freemium game, of course, you, you have to sell some virtual items or uh, some virtual goods. And I, th I think uh, most, of <coughs> I mean, most of the games in the uh, in near future will switch to this uh, monetization uh, strategy. Uh, and um, in, in this sense, it's very important, I think, that, uh, that a game designer f thinks through uh, the, the whole game economic, uh, economics model the way where it's easily uh, changeable for different platforms. That means if you're gonna sell some boosts or some uh, some items, uh, there should be uh, some separation from uh, of of the of the selling procedure from uh, from the the way the the purchase or the sale is made. So it's kind of it's it's more technical issue. It's I think uh, it's like separating the different responsibilities into the responsibilities into different layers and uh, that makes it actually easier to to uh, transfer the game to different platforms because when only the top layer have to be uh, changed or modified and the economy under uh, under it stays the same and I think I think nowadays it's um, uh, quite easily uh, easy so solving problem and uh, it's uh, it's just a matter of uh, how the game designer can really think through the... Well, as economy. a uh, sponsor, uh, I can tell that uh, what we're looking for when sponsoring games is uh, potential for building up brands around the game. So if we see a game that has the potential to perform on our website as a standalone Flash game, we're looking into, okay, how can we tie it into our social layer? Can we make a mobile game out of it, be it an HTML5 or a native app? Yeah. Uh, so um, it's really a matter of uh, designing the game and looking at the game that we're being presented with, if it was designed with cross-platform in mind. Because some games, uh, you see that they work well in Flash, they work well, well on a touch screen, and they could potentially work well in social network. Um, just to add to that, um, I mean, I think when the beauty of Flash games is usually the production time and the cost is quite low. So if you have a great novel idea, um, cool gameplay, put it out in Flash and see how well it does. And um, I mean, it's it's great to have um, your thoughts on different platforms, but I think that um, generally gameplay can be transferable quite quickly, uh, quite easily on different platforms. Um, so what you do is you put a game out, um, a fl put it, a Flash game out, and see how well it does. If if you're getting millions of views think about you should port it and um, Steambirds did this they, they put it out um, on Flash and they didn't have they, they weren't going to port it to f iPhone or Android or anything 
but they saw how well it did and they decided to port it after um, and they've made over $150,000 just from um, porting it to Android and iOS. Um, Steambirds. Um, so, yeah, so, um, I mean, I think multi-platform is great if your game does well, but don't start by thinking, okay, I'm going to make this game, I'm going to put it on iOS and Android and everything and spend hours and hours of development time and money and to realize that it's a flop and waste that time. So what you're saying is that, you know, it's uh, very easy to take small risks and then focus on what works. Yeah. I also think it's a little presumptuous to say that you're going to be able to just develop um, a, a Flash game and then later on make it a social game because either your game is social from the very beginning or it's not and not all games lend themselves to be social. I quickly change the slide here because we're now talking about Facebook versus web games. Excellent. Please go on. Excellent. So, um, and so social games obviously need to have social features that actually make sense um, and they're not bolted on. So what I, I feel that if you had just developed a flash game, you put it out, it's successful, it may be a complete flop in social if you just try, try to port it straight over. Uh, you may actually need to design a different game. However, um, I think you may see some success on other platforms, such as you know iOS and Android. Uh, yes, I agree with it absolutely. Uh, social games, uh, I mean, uh, the games that are successful on some some portals or on mobile mobile devices, uh, they they are not necessarily can, but they can be successful on uh, Facebook or other so social platforms, uh, and. Uh, uh, the social mechanics are quite, uh, uh, you know, tough issue, and it's kind of there, there are not that many people who actually can can create really great social mechanics in the game, and actually, game genre is actually dictates if this social mechanics is possible or not possible. So, so the Farville is actually is a game with really great social mechanics, and let's say, uh, let's say, PopCap Bejeweled. Uh, doesn't have a social mechanics, uh, you know, on that level. But still, it's possible to tweak the game, and it's it's uh, it's it's just the matter of uh, uh, of how good you gonna implement the social twist into the game. And uh, the 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 thing is that very rare, very few companies actually succeeded in tweaking a non-social game and into the social game. It's it's very difficult. Well, uh, what we found, uh, you know, if we are talking about social network versus a web world, yeah. is that uh, things that work best on a uh, just a standalone website are multiplayer games. If we're talking about transferring it into Facebook, for example, so we found that real life multiplayer of match three games do phenomenally well both on our portal and on Facebook. So that's something that, uh, as a uh, game developer, you know, you should keep in mind if you want to design cross-platform experiences. So uh, moving on, we have a whole bunch of questions here that was hopefully we can run through really quick. So if you have a company with uh, limited resources uh, and you know you can't pursue all options at once, uh, when does it make sense to involve in uh, social networking apps? And wh when does it make sense to focus on smaller web games? I think Alex has a lot of feedback I'll, here. I'll, I'll, start, I'll start that off. I think really that mostly depends on what kind of expertise your team has. So if your team's expertise is just Flash, it's going to be really difficult for you to develop a social game on Facebook because a lot of the the core of the game is going to be back end. Um, so in that sense, develop a uh, de develop a casual downloadable title. You know, if that if that has been your expertise, that can still monetize relatively well. If you create a success, that's awesome. Um, if you do have the skills within your team to do both kind of front-end flash and back-end stuff, um, try a social game. Social games are not are gigantic investments to, um, to develop. Uh, they, they can be very surprisingly successful financially. So I would, I would certainly advocate to trying it. So if I try it, should I go through a publisher or publish it self, oh, myself? Wow. That's a whole other panel. <laughs> um, What's your experience with that, though? Um, so, I firmly believe that um, if you're going to be successful in, in any particular genre that you choose, let's say that's going to be social, you kind of have to n know and own certain things around it. And so, if you feel like you're 
not gonna and so those things could be for example marketing marketing your game um, if you're if you feel you don't have the resources or you're not gonna be able to own them ever or you're just not interested in doing that a publisher will do a great job for you um, ultimately you're giving something up in terms of flexibility in terms of kind of the selection of games that you can create because they're going to be choosing and based on their portfolio um, and so a publisher can be a great way to distribute games if you don't plan to build this expertise internally I would advocate to try to build it internally uh, because it's fun that's one and two is it's more sustainable as, as your only IP over time mm -hmm. yeah uh, speaking about uh, publishers um, I, th I think uh, era of publishers is uh, finishing uh, just I, th I think the CEO of Uga had a presentation on uh, previous casual connect in uh, not previous in uh, the one in Hamburg it was uh, the topic was uh, that uh, publisher p p publishers are obsolete and uh, I think he had some points and I agree with it but but uh, now social games uh, <coughs> that are produced by one team and when run or published by a um, publisher's team, uh, they, they can't be successful bec just because uh, the team have to be at the place of the uh, marketer in the sense of the measuring all KPIs of the game and when making marketing decisions is absolutely critical in social platforms. And uh, I think uh, the Going to the publisher, just you have to ensure that you have very deep connection with their marketing team, and when you will be really uh, able to uh, work together in a very uh, deep, deep way in, in uh, analyzing all the KPIs together, having access to all numbers, sharing all data, and sometimes it's not possible. Uh, there are some publishers, I think, that are not doing this. There are maybe some I don't know. They are maybe very good at it, but. The company who's going towards this direction should be should be very careful to ma make sure this happens on Facebook, particularly on Facebook. Yeah. All right, and I think uh, we are gonna go through the last question before going into uh, talking with the audience. Uh, so, uh, do you guys see any real hidden uh, costs? You know, something that is really unexpected when pursuing. Uh, Facebook game development was Flash uh, or going for uh, smaller Flash games. Have you guys encountered that and what was that? I think for me getting into social games the biggest surprise was the cost of operating the game, not development of the game itself. I think you'll, you'll find, at least we found that the cost of development is a fraction of what you're going to need to support um, going forward assuming that your game is successful. So I think that was... So it is true that you expand the team after the game launch? Um, we would keep the team working on it for a long time after that, yeah. <coughs> yeah, same for us actually, I think, yes. Uh, I mean, developing a game on uh, Facebook, it's uh, it's, a de it's like developing a, a service and running it. And uh, your team stays with the, with, the, with the game and changes it, measuring the KPIs, and it's a very intense process, and your team should be ready to, to be in very intense development phase for many months in a row. So it's not like develop the game, release it and forget it. It's it's quite different. So basically we come back to the fact that, you know, making smaller flash games is way less risk in terms of investment. Yeah, it's less risk and less return on your yeah, yeah, I mean I think operating a game, so the costs incurring incurred in operating your game are kind of a function of success of your game as well. So if your game is you know, is not successful or it's basically not getting the traffic you need, you dismantle the team and you shut down the game, right? So you can always get away from that. But um, if it, you know, if it does have a certain level of success or it, it continues to grow, uh, you're going to see some more and more interesting challenges around it and you're going to need a team that's going to be able to solve those challenges for you. I think for um, indie developers rather than big teams, I mean, <clears throat> There are a lot of um, indie developers on FGL, and I think the biggest hi hidden cost for them is actually time. Um, I mean, for example, with Spill, um, developers I used to or probably still do have to um, implement an API and add a ton of languages <laughs> into their game, and a lot of developers which we provide, by the yeah, way. <laughs> you, of course, they provide it, but they have they have to implement it, and um, they. I mean, there, there's a lot of complicated APIs out there that they don't realize they'll have to spend time doing. And you know, as an, as a developer, time is money, and um, 
I think that's that's a big cause. But still, you basically sells a game, you implement the APIs, and that's it. You move on to the next project. Right, and generally they don't get paid till the APIs uh, implemented. So if they're trying to make rent, <laughs> and they, well, um, and I think they on to... on that positive note, <laughs> we're gonna go <laughs> to the uh, questions to the audience. Okay, we have a very distinguished panel here. We have time for maybe one or two questions. If we do two, Al Morgi want to set up at the same time. Hello? Now, you can hear me. One of the hiding costs that you have been talking is also related about the hosting, because I have been known that the hosting of the games, especially in Facebook, is a huge cost if you have many users. And it's also... I, I think that's a very good point. Um, again, that's a function of success of the game. Uh, presumably, if, you're, if you have a social game that monetizes well, as your hosting costs grow, your revenue will also grow. Uh, they can be gigantic bills, but I would hope that they monetize as well enough to be able to more than cover those costs. Time for one more question. For uh, indie developers, what would you suggest, since that you said that publishers are kind of becoming obsolete, then is it better for, uh, for a small team to look for a dev for investor and then build the, grow up the team and Build the product by itself, by itself, or is it better to go to the publisher? For now? <coughs> well, you can go to publisher, uh, depending. You know, again, I mean, what what platform you are developing for? If it's Facebook, uh, uh, I think social games are are more tough to run because you have to really spend much more time with it. Uh, if you t we talk about mobile devices, mobile pl platforms, iOS and Android, uh, you, you'll have to support the game, but maybe it will be easier. And uh, so on for these different cases, the decision going with publisher or not going is different. Let's say it's it's again, I think for small teams, the biggest challenge is the marketing budget. I mean, you don't have 200,000 dollars to spend on marketing uh, per month yeah exactly <laughs> so so that's you know it's it's game of you know, pros and cons I think you, you should make a decision for yourself sometimes the game can really go very viral if you make a really great game and it will, it will spread around without any, any marketing but sometimes a great game will not spread around at all so it's again matter of decision I mean uh, judging your advantages, disadvantages, and of course, I, th I think you have to try many publishers. Don't st st stick with just one. Go talk with many of them. They are they are very flexible. I mean, they will get very flexible if you really try uh, show that you are making some really good products, and they will find some 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 fit for you probably. But I think I mean, of course, if, if you can manage to not get a publisher, I think it's the best way, and it's just with higher, bigger upside for your company and for your team. Okay, well, please join me in.